Um, so hello everyone, I'm Hillary Kane and I am a member of the Coordinated Campaign Committee. I'm also the outgoing national treasurer um, and I'm joined here today by Sherry Honkala. Say hi, Sherry. Hello. <laughs> Um, and we are very excited to offer this workshop on frontline communities running for office. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to share screen and bring up the presentation, um, which will include some introductions. Um, so let's get started. There we are. And yes, so introduction, let's get to know each other. So if folks could sort of go around the room and just say who you are and where you're from. And if you're running for office, of course, we'd love to hear that. Um, and, you know, perhaps maybe why you joined this session and actually to facilitate that int the introductions, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute to so we can better see each other. Um, and then we'll go back to the presentation. So I'm gonna, um, I'll just start it off with Sue since you're, the first box on my screen. So introduce yourself and then please pass it to somebody else. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Sue Edward. I am running for uh, US House Representatives in Missouri's fifth district, which is the Kansas City area. I am running this time around because of the road decision just really infuriated me. But I'm also our chapter's election committee coordinator and I joined this session because I wanna learn how to uh, recruit candidates or how to do a better job at recruiting candidates, especially reaching out above and beyond our membership um, to the people who really need the Green Party and we wanna be able to reach them. So thank you. And next in line on my screen is Sherry Hankala. Hi, I'm glad. Well, Sherry, there'll be a time to do a more in-depth introduction. So why don't we pass it to somebody else? Maybe Jeff Sparling, who's next on my screen. All righty, um, Jeff Sparling coming to you from Warren, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit, running for state house um, in the newly created Michigan 14th district. So uh, doing that and uh, working trying to keep up with the standards of Sherry A. Wells, who is also on here. And uh, what a taskmaster she is. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, we're working together and, and trying to get some synergy with uh, the campaigns. In fact, with all the green campaigns in Michigan, especially those that are statewide and uh, coordinating with the locals. And I think that uh, this time around, uh, we're, we're going at it a little bit better. Uh, attributed much to our new uh, elections coordinator. So there you are. Great, thank you. Well, and speaking of Sherry Wells, Sherry, why don't you go next? All right, I uh, joined the Green Party because uh, I'm from Michigan. I live in uh, two, two suburban towns over from Jeff. Uh, I joined the Green Party because someone, when I was running for a local office, came up and in the process of talking with me, invited me to look at the 10 key values. And my no high pressure, my reaction was, I've been working for this. And so that's why I joined. I've been running for office. Uh, the education offices, as we've said on other things, are what keeps us on the ballot. I'm running for U of M uh, Board of Regents. Um, my line is that I got a, a my BA degree from Mich Michigan State, my law degree from Wayne State, and now I want to go to University of Michigan but not pay tuition, so I'll get on their Board of Regents. I'm the elections coordinator. But why I'm happy to have Jeff and Lou here is that I believe we can turn Detroit green. There are areas around here, Detroit, Royal Oak Township and Pontiac that have very low voter turnout. I mentioned to one man in Detroit that people have been recently disillusioned with the Democrat party. He said, try 40 years. So my new signs say, vote Green Party, your alternative. And half of them are going to go in the Detroit part of Jeff's district. 
And, and Lou can talk about Detroit Greens. Yeah, well, why don't we um, pass it to Lou and just for introductions, just let's try to keep it short, sort of name where you're from and whether you're a candidate and what you wanna learn. Uh, Lou Novak here, uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, Green Party of Michigan. I am not a candidate, but looking to see how I might better support those candidates here in the city of Detroit from the frontline communities. Thank you. Great. Um, how about Mary? You're next on my screen. Hi, my name is Mary Sanders, and I'm here in Hartford, Connecticut. And I was asked about two weeks ago to be the congressional district number one candidate running against a 22 year incumbent who all he does is in his newsletters is brag about how many military contracts Connecticut was awarded. So I'm a peace activist and um, voted green whenever there was an option, although I didn't officially switch parties until 2016. I was the first a candidate um, the following year uh, for state rep as a write-in and then as the num and then um, I petitioned to get on the ballot the following year. I ran for then I ran for Hartford City Council, and then for for Connecticut State Senator, and this year for the con uh, con congressional seat of District One. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I need help. That's good. <laughs> I have no I have no money, so I'm here to learn. Number one, sure. how to ask how to ask for money. Just do it. <laughs> well, that's great. So um, so this is not going to be that kind of training, but we can certainly talk about that in the Q&A towards the end and point you to some other resources as well. Um, so why don't we just keep moving through so we can get through agenda, um, uh, sorry, introduction. So I, Sonia, are you able to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Sonia. Um, I'm from Union City, California. Uh, I am not a candidate, but I uh, there's an open city council seat here, and you know it's become completely unaffordable to live here. So I figured I would come and attend and see what it's like before uh, you know committing to anything. Great, welcome, um, Debbie. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Debbie Madera. I'm uh, with the Lucas County, Ohio Green Party and the Ohio Green Party. Um, I am here because I have huge admiration for Sherry and having lived in poverty and almost homeless for several years, that, that's really important to me. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Jim. Hello, I'm Jim Cushland. I'm uh, in Toledo, Ohio. I've actually worked a little bit with Debbie uh, because Toledo and Lucas County are the same thing in Ohio. I ran for the Toledo City Council at large uh, seat last year in 2021. Um, and I guess I'd have to say I'm mostly here to, you know, any pickup advice for candidates and whether your future past or present. And well, for all those Michigan people out there, I, I would love to have for Ohio with the ballot access and keeping it that Michigan has. Great, thank you. Um, how about Ryan? Oh, hi, hi yes. My, my name is Ryan and I'm from South Jersey, born and raised in New Jersey and South Jersey. I'm in the Philly metro area. That's Philadelphia. For those of you who don't know, Philadelphia slang. I I I I, I call it Philly. Anyways, I as do those of us who live here. So yes. Oh, where do you live? <laughs> both Sherry and I live in Philadelphia. We're both we're both uh, Philly folks. So what part of South Jersey? Or what I, town? I I don't want to give too much from where I live. No but worries. Say Salem County. Okay, great. Welcome, uh, Ryan. I, I'm, thank you. I'm not very far from Center City, Philly. But Great. anyway, I'm here because I want to learn more about running for office and helping other people run for office. And I'm with the Green Party because I want to see more third parties have a voice in our government, especially those that are left-wing progressive like the Green Party is. Great, thank you. Um, Liana, 
Nice to see you. Hi, Hillary. Thank you so much um, for offering this. My name is Liana West. I am currently serving as the first vice co-chair of the Arizona Green Party. And I am running for as a write-in candidate for the Arizona governor. And I support the Green Party because I believe currently the Green Party has the most sensible plan to transition away from dangerous uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy. It also has a plan to uphold certain things that our government has completely forgot about, like reparations and um, certain rights, human rights, that our government currently does not handle correctly. So yeah, over. Thank you so much for having this. I'm excited to hear from Sherry. I have a lot of respect for what she has done for housing here in Arizona. We have a huge population that is growing of unhoused individuals and it's a very desperate situation. So I'm looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, over. Great, thank you. And then Kirit, you might be last on the list. I don't know if you now have access to a mic or if you just want to introduce yourself in the chat. Yeah, I'm on my uh, I'm on my cell now. So great, nice to be able to uh, see yeah, you and I'm, hear you. I'm, a, I'm in the Green Party of Virginia. I am treasurer of the state party. I also am co-founder of a local, but I'm interested in this topic because I am on the tenant landlord commission. So I represent uh, low income people in Arlington County where I live. Great, well, thank you all. Um, we'll do our best to cover many of these topics. Um, I'm gonna share screen again, um, just to, we're gonna just sort of go through a shortish presentation and then we'll open it up for dialogue and Q&A. So just a little bit more about us. So this is sort of more the, the longer introduction for Sherry. Um, I'll just say that I first met Sherry, I think in December, 2010. Um, and it was like right after, you know, the then election year, you know, 2010. And there was some sort of, you know, left progressive, um, you know, post-election debrief meeting that I went to as a, you know, as probably the Green Party of Philadelphia leadership at the time. And we were already thinking about, you know, the next year, 2011 is a, you know, in Philadelphia, it's, we basically have elections every single year. So odd years would be local elections. And what was coming up on the 2011 ballot was sheriff. And so this left progressive, you know, coalition of people we're all sitting talking about, you know, what to make of the election results and Sherry was there and I had certainly knew of Sherry as an activist in Philadelphia. And I turned to the person sitting next to me, I don't remember who it was at the time. And I said, you know, like, how amazing would it be if we could get Sherry to run as a green. And, you know, we sort of kept whispering and chit chatting and it was like, you know, and, and she's such a strong anti-poverty activist, like, you know, sheriff basically, what does the sheriff do in Philadelphia? Like they evict people from their homes. Like we could, if we could get Sherry to run on a no eviction platform, how amazing would that be? And basically I cold emailed her, <laughs> I think, and maybe did some cold calling and, you know, a few months, couple months later, like, you know, it was done. And, um, that that's a little bit of the story of how we connected with Sherry and you know I've been supporting Sherry's campaigns ever since um, serving as her treasurer both in her 2011 run for sheriff and then again in 2017 when she ran in a special election for um, state representative but enough about me talking about Sherry. Sherry why don't you also give folks a little bit more of your background for maybe folks who don't know your history. Because she's also had a few other important runs, like, you know, VP, you know, just a few other things. <laughs> Sherry. So, um, first of all, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm excited that 
I'm, I'm here. Uh, I think this is one of the most important things is trying to figure out how to get folks from uh, frontline communities into our party, uh, as well as running for political office. I ran um, for, as Hillary said, for sheriff. Uh, I ran for vice president with Jill Stein. And then I also ran uh, for state representative in the 197 in which um, there was a voter fraud and four people were indicted but just the, you know, the, the low end of the totem pole uh, and uh, nothing ever happened as a result of uh, folks interfering with my election at that time. Uh, you know, I, I'm a part of an organization called the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, uh, not to be confused with um, Barber's organization and that's really important because um, uh, Reverend Barber and Liz Theo Harris uh, work very much, uh, they're a part of the Biden administration. So that's how you can tell the difference between the two different campaigns. We don't take money from uh, banks or corporations, never have, never will. And uh, I encourage folks to uh, find out more about our work and link other low-income folks across the country uh, to this process because we think one of the processes is to get them to actually um, join an independent political party and to um, run for political office. So that's a little bit about me. I'm a formerly homeless mom. Uh, and I, I still live in the poorest district in the state of Pennsylvania. You're on mute, Hillary. <laughs> Thanks, rookie move. You know, it's only been like two and a half years since I've been doing this whole Zoom thing. Um, so anyway, I'm Hillary Kane and I am, as I said at the beginning, I am the outgoing national treasurer of the Green Party of the United States. Um, I've been involved in the Green Party for over 20 years, um, cutting my teeth on the Nader campaign in 2000, and has served as Sherry's treasurer for both of her runs for office. Um, well, not her national run, not as VP. Um, and I've also been a member of the Coordinated Campaign Committee and have done just a lot of um, campaign training over the years and have played various roles on campaigns, um, most recently sort of getting typecasted in the treasurer role, but certainly have done some other things as well. Um, so I think the first thing that we wanna talk about um, is what do we mean by frontline communities? And so why don't we, um, folks can come off mute if they want. Um, who here wants to give a definition of what, what, how you would define this term or what it means to you? Don't all shout at once. If you're talking, you, we can't hear you. Or feel free to put stuff in the chat as well. You've got us all on mute. Um, I didn't do it intentionally. I was muting people before when we were doing introductions and there was background noise, but it did seem like you were able to come off mute. Well, I mean, folks, like I said, you can put stuff in the chat. Um, I mean, Sherry, do you want to talk about how your organization defines this term? Yeah, I, I think for us, um, uh, it's folks that are out there struggling for food, clothing, housing, all the basic necessities of life um, and that are doing, you know, uh, mutual aid work out on the front lines. And that's what we've been doing uh, you know, before it became trendy with uh, COVID is uh, doing mutual aid, um, which is very different than a lot of models where they do the charity. Um, we really think it has to be a two-way process because we see uh, problems with poverty, hunger, and homelessness and all of that as systems problems and not problems of individuals. Um, so, uh, yeah, essential workers, 
somebody put in the chat, essential workers. Yeah, so, um, and it's really important. I know people don't like to hear this, but our analysis is, um, is that, you know, during COVID especially, there was a big reset um, with uh, jobs and um, a lot of moving in by corporations of electronics and technology and uh, robotics and AI. And we're, now we're gonna begin to see the permanently unemployed. So it's a really important time right now to engage frontline communities. So where I used to work in a, uh, uh, the Teamsters, I was a union member, worked in the Teamsters, worked every night on um, the floor and people would say, we got to work to get um, $15 an hour. And at the same time, engineers were coming in every day and um, putting in robotics uh, to put an end to our very job that we were doing. So these are things that um, are making this growing group of people grow across the country that are part of the frontline communities. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that sums it up nicely. Folks on the front line of the economic and social injustices. All right, so we have a short, shortish video that we'd like to show about why this matters. Um, this is Sherry. Do you want to cue this up or? Sure. Yeah, we could just show it. Okay, so uh, just yeah, know that it is um, comes from a Canadian context, and so when you hear um, talk about the new Democrats, know that we're not talking about our Democrats, and you know, just put the party labels aside, and you'll get the overall picture. All right, and let me just make sure I'm sharing sound on top of this, so that way, um, hold on, I just want, let me, I might have to redo the sharing, so just hold on a second. Um, advanced uh, computer audio share, whoops. I also wanna share the screen, not just the audio, hold on a second. All right, here we go. Screen and share sound together. There we go. And if somebody give me a thumbs up, that'd be great. No sound yet, hold on. My name is Kiefer Sutherland. Many of you may know me as an actor, but there's something in my background that you may not know, something which I am very proud of. I am also a grandson of the late Tommy Douglas, a premier who brought enormous change to Saskatchewan and the rest of Canada. He was also the first leader of the New Democratic Party. Using his voice in a recording that he had made in 1962, we'd like to share a story with you, a story that he made famous as early as 1940. It's a story of a place called Mouseland, and it's as important today as it was many years ago. It's not just a piece of history, it's really one of the best explanations you'll ever hear about why Canadians like you and me support the New Democrats. The NDP and the members of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union across Canada are proud to present this animated version of Mouseland. It's a message worth preserving for generations to come and for current generations. So please join me now as my grandfather takes us to a place that he called Mouseland.
should elect a government made up of cats. You just look at the history of Canada for the last 90 years, and maybe you'll see that they weren't any stupider than we are. Now, I'm not saying anything against the cats. <laughs> they were nice fellows. They conducted the government with dignity. They passed good laws. That is, laws that were good for cats. But the laws that were good for cats <laughs> weren't very good for mice. One of the laws said that mouse holes had to be big enough so a cat could get his paw in. <laughs> Another law said that mice could only travel at certain speeds so that a cat could get his breakfast without too much physical effort. All the laws were good laws for cats. But oh, they were hard on the mice. And life was getting harder and harder. And when the mice couldn't put up with it anymore, they decided something had to be done about it. So they went en masse to the pole. They voted the black cat out. And they put in the white cat. The white cat, the white cat had put up a terrific campaign. They said all that mouse land needs is more vision. They said the trouble with mouse land is those round mouse holes we've got. If you put us in, we'll establish square mouse holes. And they did. And the square mouse holes were twice as big as the round mouse holes. And now the cat could get both his paws in. And life was tougher than ever. And when they couldn't take that anymore, they voted the white cats out and put the black ones in again. And then they went back to the white cats, and then to the black cats. They even tried half black cats and half white cats. <laughs> and they called that coalition. They even got one government made up of cats with spots on them. They were cats that tried to make a noise like a mouse, but they ate like a cat. You see, my friends, the trouble wasn't with the color of the cat. The trouble was that they were cats. And because they were cats, they naturally looked after cats instead of mice. Presently, there came along one little mouse. One little mouse. Who had an idea. An Everyone idea. can be muted, My please. My friends, watch out for the little fellow with an idea. And he said to the other mice, look, fellas, why do we keep on electing a government made up of cats? Why don't we elect a government made up of mice? Oh, he said he's a Bolshevik. Lock him up. <laughs> so they put him in jail. <laughs> but I want to remind you that you can lock up a mouse or a man, but you can't lock up an idea. All right, so I think folks get the, the picture from that. Um, any and feel free to come off mute just any commentary or dialogue i know some folks might have seen this before um ryan that one part why do we like the government of cats when we can like the government of mice or something on something to that effect yeah exactly uh, i like the personification there if that's if i'm using the right term correctly i think so yeah I'm not an English teacher, but I'll allow it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, obviously in this example, there's a lot of metaphors for who the mice and the cats are. But I think for this particular presentation, we're really talking about, you know, folks' economic interest. Um, there's, you know, the Green Party has really made moves in the last, um, you know, six, seven years to be, uh, you know, 
position itself as an eco-socialist party, as a working class party, um, and really, you know, not just be perceived and, and not just be perceived, but not just be a party about environmental issues, but also about economic justice and social justice issues, recognizing that those two go hand in hand, like we can't solve one of these crises without solving the other. Um, and so, you know, one of the tasks that we have is to try to elect more mice, right? To get more working class people and poor people to run for office to better represent their own issues. And yet it's a big challenge for us um, as a party. And so exploring some of those challenges and brainstorming solutions is kind of what we were hoping to do today in this workshop. Um, all right, so just um, let's come on, moving on to the next slide. All right. so. The basic candidate pipeline, and obviously, you know, to some degree, there's many steps involved, but in the broad strokes, right, you have to have people who want to run for office in the first place. Um, in order to have get them to run as Greens, they have to know that the Green Party exists um, as, as a entity, know what our values are, know what we stand for. And of course, we have to know that they exist, right? It's not just a one-way street. Um, those candidates have to get the support of the Green Party itself, whether it's the local chapter or the state chapter. Um, and then they also have to navigate all of these bureaucratic procedures to get on the ballot. And at every step of the way, you know, there are some stumbling blocks in terms of how frontline communities um, decide to run for office and decide to run as a Green. And so we're going to unpack some of those and share some of our experiences. Um, and again, like I said, brainstorm solutions at every step of the way. So the first part of the pipeline is the candidate desiring to run. And I think one of the challenges that I've seen, and to some extent, you know, low-income people are no different than other people in this regard, is that most of us actually don't know people who have run for office. We haven't necessarily seen it modeled in our own life. I mean, maybe we in this call are a bit of outliers since a lot of us have had experience, but in terms of like the general population, certainly that's not the case. And particularly among low income folks, that's really not the case. Um, you know, we certainly know statistics about how, um, you know, our elected bodies really skew heavily towards people with money, right? To the top 1%. Um, and folks around them. And so the flip side of that is that folks in low income com communities often have very little direct experience with the electoral system. Um, and then, of course, there's just also like, you know, what people have sometimes called like, you know, a bandwidth tax. Um, there's just the daily stress of simply surviving in this world. And that certainly takes a toll on people and doesn't necessarily give folks a lot of like, free time and energy to, to sit there and think about, you know, like, you know, people aren't necessarily sitting around, sitting around like, wow, I'm really bored today. Maybe I'll like go run for office, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously getting people to see themselves as candidates is certainly the biggest hurdle. And so Sherry, I don't know if you wanted to, to chime in with any, any of your um, experience, but I know when we first approached you, um, there were a lot of reasons that you were sort of hesitant um, but eventually you did finally commit. But I wonder if you want to talk about this, just getting more folks to even want to run for office and to see that as a viable path. Yes. Um, uh, I, I remember very clearly the day you came in uh, to the office and officially asked me again if um, I would be interested in running for sheriff. Um, and the joke I make all the time is I had lots of experience with the sheriff's department because of all of my participation in nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, uh, you know, the the thing the thing is is that um, even though poor people and low income folks are busy running around trying to figure out how to survive, um, I think that it's important to also. Um, you know, lift up some of the things that can happen as a result of running for office. You know, one, it can put them into uh, uh, touch, put them in touch with people that are busy um, working to make this a better world in all over all different parts of the country. 
Um, they'll be able to expand their own database. Um, they can get some practice in talking about the various different issues. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, Hillary uh, was very good at selling the idea to me. And um, uh, uh, I think that it's really important to approach somebody that's a part of the frontline community, um, not with just what can we get from you, but um, what the party can bring to the candidate. For sure. I think we were both younger and more naive <laughs> back then, but um, but no regrets, no regrets, that's for sure. Um, so the next part of the pipeline is, of course, the knowledge of the Green Party and vice versa. So, you know, I don't, to be honest, Jerry, I don't even remember when we talked, if you knew what the Green Party was or had familiarity. I mean, you were already sort of obviously very politically active, right? You weren't just like somebody off the street. Um, but for a lot of folks, you know, even people who are politically active or active on issues, they may not really know about us because, of course, there's, you know, huge media blackouts, um, as we've seen across the country, they do their darndest to keep us off the ballot. And so it's often, you know, folks are not always familiar with the Green Party and what our platform is, or they may just have this very narrow and limited vision of, oh, that's a bunch of tree huggers, right? which yes, we are, but also, um, you know, we care about other issues like healthcare, like reparations, like a living wage, et cetera, et cetera. And so part of it is both is an education for candidates, low income and black indigenous people of color candidates who are largely unfamiliar with the Green Party, but we also have to kind of do our own uh, self-education, right? We are often not super connected. And when I say we as the Green Party, to those poor people's movements and um, movements led by low income leadership. And so we're not often knowledgeable about who those potential candidates and leaders are because we're not necessarily running in those same circles either. It's really a two way street. So we have to do a lot better um, at simply showing up and being present where those um, you know, fights and struggles are. Like here in Philadelphia, one of the you know flashpoints that's getting some attention is a low income um, housing development that is essentially bordering, practically sitting on the University of Pennsylvania campus. Um, and there's a move to you know essentially move that community somewhere else to displace them and to you know for the university to have more chance to develop and that's become quite a, a flashpoint. And we've made sure um, as the Green Party of Philadelphia that we have had you know, support and folks you know, out there um, ten, you know, camping out with people. Um, we have to show up for folks and not just come around when election time comes around. Sherry, you wanted to add anything? Yeah, um, I'll also just put a plug in that um, if people wanna, or if people could put in the chat for me, Poor People's Army and how to get a hold of um, us and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign and some of the frontline organizing that we're doing. But I think something that's really gonna be important to all of us uh, and especially folks in frontline communities um, is uh, you know, the Joe Biden impact um which was uh there you know there's been a, a great deal of money that's been you know put out to the nonprofit industrial complex um where <clears throat> many different organizations um are talking really good rhetoric about um here's the changes we'd like to see and this is why you should still be a part of the democratic party um and uh, for poor folks to be begin to pull back the curtain and see that the Democratic Party really is continuing to be the war party, that the billions of dollars that are sent over to wherever in the world, um, we suffer on the front lines immediately as a result of this. Um, 
so it's just really important to you know continue to pull back that curtain uh and to you know uh that person that's doing organizing in a frontline community and isn't tied to corporations or to big banks they're going to want to really see that oh my god you know the green party has been separate of corporations and banks forever um, and that's the political party we want to align with. And that's the party that I want to run for office on. So, um, because I think a lot of folks in frontline communities at first, they see the Green Party as still um, that the only thing that they care about is the environment um, or uh, they have a, a identity issue approach to things. Uh, as opposed to um, addressing some of the issues that face people regardless of what color or um, where they come from. Uh, uh, but the real, the additional um, frontline struggles that they're dealing with with living on the bottom. Thanks. Um, all right, the next challenge and hurdle is getting support from the Green Party. So someone comes along, they've been identified, they're interested, they're from, they become familiar with the Green Party, and then they want our endorsement and support and our ballot line. And I have seen this in the past in my own local party and state party, where the, it, people sometimes don't necessarily get a warm reception. So sometimes... And I'll put myself in this in my in this bucket, right? And I'm unlearning a lot of behavior, but certainly, and I would say this is more of a you know this is a class and sort of education bias about what do I think candidates for public office should look like, should sound like, um, how they should present themselves. Um, a lot of times, folks, you know, despite best intentions, will still essentially judge people based on these standards that don't necessarily work for the communities that we're actually trying to reach out to and serve. And so I've had, I've seen candidates, um, you know, be dismissed because perhaps they didn't have a strong a stance on certain environmental issues. Um, not to, you know, their stance on social justice issues was quite strong, but sometimes, you know, what, what is sometimes disappointing for me in the Green Party is we will sometimes let candidates who will be very strong on environmental issues and admittedly weaker on economic justice and other social justice issues, and that often gets a pass whereas the, the reverse doesn't always. And so obviously we want our candidates to be strong on all the issues. But that's a lot, you know, that's an educational process that takes time. And so um, so sometimes that's the barrier is just perceiving, like, do we believe this, this person, you know, looks and sounds like a candidate in the way that we believe that should happen? Um, and then some and then I think the other thing, and I think Sherry alluded to this, is that we've got to be prepared to like truly support our candidates. And when it comes to folks from frontline communities and low-income individuals that means a lot more than what we might be used to. And so a lot more financial support for sure. And that seems obvious, but it's not always apparent or folks aren't really realizing what that means, um, as well as other types of stretching and bending. I think some of the other, you know, I don't want to say like culture clashes that we had certainly in the party, um, you know, early on was, you know, I would say my first 10 years of experience in the party um, before we really started working with Sherry and the Poor People's Campaign more deeply, we had a we had a culture, I and mean, we still do to some extent, of like, you know, all volunteer, everything is about, you know, like being for the cause and, you know, like we're just this is this is our, you know, labor of love, you know, and realizing that some people can be just as dedicated, but they need to eat, they need to feed themselves. They don't necessarily have some other job that keeps them, you know, in fish and chips, as they say. And we really had to shift and stretch and bend to recognize that it was okay to pay people for the work they did and to pay some people and not other people. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think this kind this the pandemic has made that shift happen for in a lot of places in the last year. Um, certainly, I think a lot of the conversations I've had most recently um, have recognized that, but certainly that's not where we were 10 years ago when we first started working with Sherry and really had to, to like learn and grow as an organization to get to the point where we were comfortable with, you know, paying people for signatures and, and not just like paying a petitioning company, but paying our own greens, um, you know, paying people to work the polls on election day to lit drop all of those kinds of things. Um, so Sherry, I don't know, you know, I, I, again, reflections or comments from your sort of your side of- Yeah, of I just think, yeah. I mean, I mean, when people talk about wanting the participation of poor folks, um, but they don't have the privilege of volunteering. Um, I think that, you know, one of the best things that the Green Party did in Philadelphia uh, and in the various different campaigns that I was a part of is give people an opportunity uh, to show that they too uh, wanted to build this party, that they too wanted to um, help me run for office and win. Um, and so that, you know, sometimes means doing something different and really investing in people. And um, there was a whole lot of that going on because it needed to happen. The first time I ran for sheriff, I mean, I didn't have any like business clothes, whatever, uh, Paul Grubbs, uh, partner, Karen, you know, she went out and uh, you know, bought me a bunch of like, you know, suits and stuff like that so that, you know, I could look the part. Um, so these are important stuff. Um, but also we don't want to get into a situation where, um, you know, I've seen some, a couple candidates where I just don't want to say their name out loud, um, you know, want to just hustle the party for financial resources um, but if there's, you know, a candidate that's really interested in sticking and staying, building the party, not just, you know, um, running for office once and then quitting uh, and not doing anything to help the party, uh, then that's a whole different thing. Uh, so, yes, I think that uh, it's going to get more and more like that as uh, things get rougher out here to survive. And, uh, you know, we also need to look at it like it's, a, it's an important skill and it's a, something that needs to be done in every campaign is raising money. So the more money you raise, the more staff you can have. Great. And I know there's some great comments going on in the chat. Um, we will certainly get to some of those when we get to the Q&A section, which will be very soon. Um, all right, and the last piece of the pipeline um, that maybe I have some more experience with is just the navigating the bureaucratic rules and procedures of running for office, right? And so, um, and in my experience, um, and not that, you know, folks from low-income communities don't necessarily have professional skill sets, but sometimes um, the type of work that campaign management, um, you know, and I say requires with an asterisk, because I don't know that it truly, truly requires, but it, you know, it sometimes feels like it, um, is not necessarily the same skill sets that people are bringing to the table. They're bringing other amazing skill sets, but it's not necessarily like the bureaucratic, um, you know, record keeping and receipt scanning and, you know, all the kinds of stuff that, um, you know, a campaign requires. And so that has been, you know, just like a, a challenge that needs to be overcome and thought of and dealt with in a sensitive way that respects people but also you know gets gets the rules followed um as sherry talked about with her wardrobe right so there's often challenges around um whether or not you can use campaign funds for what are quote unquote personal items and every campaign every jurisdiction is different so i know just because i we work with sherry on both a local campaign and a statewide campaign mm -hmm. And I don't remember which was writ, which, but like one of them would allow money to be spent on things like a wardrobe, the other wouldn't. 
Um, things like childcare, you know, when she first ran, her son was young and needed babysitting. Like if she was going to go out and speak at an event at night, um, you know, as a single mom, like she needed to pay a babysitter. Is that a legit campaign expense or not? Right. Um, and I think different jurisdictions will have different rules. And certainly it's the kind of issue that you can, you know, make an issue out of. Right. Um, because it's also obviously a very gendered thing, not just, um, an issue for low-income people. Um, but, you know, the idea that folks, you know, many other candidates that we've had in the past will already have that professional wardrobe, will have access to a personal vehicle that they can just drive around. Um, and so it's things like budgeting for rental cars and for gas that we were unfamiliar with the first time we ran Sherry. You know, like it just wasn't things that we had ever thought about, because quite frankly, a lot of times candidates with more economic means, even if they're not wealthy, can still bring more basically in-kind things to the table that we often sort of take for granted, whether it's, you know, access to high-speed internet, access to a cell phone, um, you know, all the access to computers and scanners and copiers, all those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, and I speak more just as her former treasurer, that there were also practical issues around just managing money, things like payroll, um, you know, things just moved a lot more quickly and I had to be more hands-on and present than I had previously. And so, you know, it wasn't always the case, like in the previous world, I could also, I'd say, oh, well, Sherry, yeah, rent that car and then forward me the receipt and I'll reimburse you in a week, right? Like, no, that wasn't necessarily going to fly if people didn't have the cash flow or even the credit card to do that, right? So it was more of like, hey, Sherry, I'm going to meet you at the rental car place and I'm going to rent the car for you in my name with you as the secondary driver and submit the receipt to myself and get somebody else to sign off on it. You know, like there was just a lot more um, stuff that we had to do because the people's inability to necessarily like lay out funds and get reimbursed later. Um, there was certainly more of an expectation um, particularly when it came to things like ballot access, as well as, you know, election day poll working, that people would be paid in cash that day. I mean, now it's maybe by Venmo, whatever, but like, you know, the point is not necessarily with the time and ability to do a lot of like, you know, to do every, I mean, we still did it legitimately. Like we got w, w nines and a whole nine yards, but it was a lot, like it required a lot more hands-on um, you know, approaches and sensitivity around those kinds of things. Um, you know, and I, and we still stepped in it. I mean, I, I will, I'll never forget the time that I was pro probably complaining to Belinda, who's on this call. Um, you know, just, I was kind of feeling like overwhelmed and just really stressed out because there was so much going on and, it, you know, it was more than I signed up for. It was more than I bargained for. Um, I think as a, you know, first time campaign treasurer, who hadn't yet worked um, with folks at this level. And I was complaining to, I think somebody about how, just like I was constantly needing to run down there with cash to run to the office and it was so much and like, God, why can't people just like, you know, it's like $10, oh my God. And I was actually, um, my cell phone had not hung up and um, it was uh, Justin, your campaign manager at the time who heard all of my bitching and moaning basically about him. <laughs> <laughs> it was horribly embarrassing. Um, and it certainly was a lesson that I will never forget. But, um, you know, there were real tensions and challenges that we all had to overcome. And, you know, particularly me, um, that I think our party, like folks are just not always ready for. And so, you know, definitely something that we need to think about and to create better systems and procedures um, and expectations around how this stuff all works. Any other thoughts, Sherry? Uh, no, I think that that sums it up uh, pretty good. I think that, um, you know, I, I think that there has been some campaigns now that uh, I think, I mean, I think it's great that we do this workshop, uh, but I think that there's some templates uh, you know, for people that are running from frontline campaigns to really learn from other folks that have run from frontline communities. I think that they're one of the best equipped to explain like, 
Have you thought about the fact that when you agree to run for office, it's not going to be like just going and speaking at a, a bunch of nice events. Um, it's also going to be like figuring out, you know, how to get on uh, the bus or rent a car and drive across town and, you know, dig into your already non-existent um, pool of resources. So um, uh, I think also showing budgets, um, how much was spent on various different campaigns uh, and how that money was raised uh, or how that money was, you know, uh, cleverly used uh, in order to, you know, grow campaigns. Great, thank you. All right, so let's talk about some solutions and this is then where we open it up and I would love to hear more experiences, challenges and, and most importantly solutions from other folks. But um, obviously, I think one of the takeaways here is that as the Green Party, we need to do a better job of allying more intentionally with poor people's movements and people of color led organizations. Um, I know there is a poor people's caucus in formation within the Green Party, and I'm hopeful that that will get um, formalized and will help us in this work. Um, I think we also need to do a lot of, you know, internal DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion, to unlearn biases and expand our notions of what candidates for public office look like. And I say that as a, you know, upper income white woman, um, you know, who has done a lot of learning over my 20 years in this party. Um, I, we did a lot of great work, I think, last year at our a and where this was a core theme and, um, and, um, topic. Um, I've also started a DEI book club that I'm happy to tell folks more about, um, but we have to constantly be pushing ourselves to, to be uncomfortable and to learn and to examine our biases, not just around, you know, race and gender and sexual orientation, but about class, which I think certainly doesn't get talked about um, as much as it, as it needs to. And then I think those of us who who can those of us with the skills and the time and the energy like we need to be cultivating some more worker bees in the party who can step in and provide that logistical support right um we need more treasurers we need more um you know press people we need, need more volunteer coordinators we need folks who can build websites um who have some of that professional and technical expertise and who can be mobilized and marshaled to to be you know, the support staff of folks on the front line so that they don't have to do it all because they can't, because none of us can. Um, so that is basically it, I think. And it, Sherry, any other final comments? And then we'd love to like, I'll no. stop sharing and we'll open it up for Q&A and dialogue. Um, no, other than uh, people can always see me as a resource uh, if there's other folks from frontline communities that are interested in running for political office, uh, to have a, com a, a conference call with me, call me up, send me uh, an email, whatever. Uh, I want to do whatever I possibly can to lift up uh, other communities so that they can run for political office. Great. All right. All right, Ryan, is your hand up from before or is that a new hand? Oh, my hand up is before, but that said, I would like to ask a question. Go for it. Do you have any advice on motivating people to want to join you, to want to join your candidacy or cause? Uh, yeah, we have a national... Um, if you go to, I believe Belinda put the information up in the chat. Um, we have, it's very interesting that uh, the two former vice presidents are getting together at a national boot camp for the Poor People's Army uh, in New Jersey um, in the middle of next month uh, to talk about all the various different ills that are happening in the world and how we can further build this movement. Uh, I think that that's a great way. Uh, anybody is 
welcome to join us at the boot camp. Uh, we're going to be going over uh, organizing skills. Um, how are we uh, raising the contradictions right now about uh, the Democratic Party saying that they're not a war party uh, with all this stuff that's happening right now in the world? So that's, yep. What's that? You bet. Pardon? Maybe Belinda can put it in the chat. <laughs> That'd be great. Other thoughts, comments, personal experiences. You can raise your virtual hand. You can say stack in the chat. You can come off mute. You can wave your arms around. However, yes, Mary. Yeah, I'll, I'll just share a little bit. I mentioned that I that I did have a couple of campaigns. Um, I never had any staff or a campaign manager. Um, even when I ran for state senator last year, and a thousand dollars was spent on my campaign because I thought it was important to at least have one newspaper ad and get some flyers and stuff out. I did. I got two hundred dollars back in contributions from some of the other members in the party, but the eight hundred dollars that came out of my pocket was very painful at the time. Um, I was laid off five or six years ago and unfortunately became permanently unemployed. So, so my income's about 18,000 a year. So I have to like, you know, measure everything I'm doing. And like now, if I'm gonna run for um, congressional district, I need to be places and I don't have transportation. So I'm taking Ubers everywhere. So these are all things that, you know, made me hesitate when I was asked to run even though, like, I mean, I, I've been low income all my life. I grew up on welfare and the housing developments. And although I had a 30 year career in nonprofits, never made, you know, that much money in the nonprofits. So my social security at this point is not that, not that, nothing to brag about. But when I lost my job and my income was cut in half, I started making tough decisions and I still had grandchildren in my home. So now that I'm alone and I have a little more, more mobility, my focus has been staying involved. And in, I've been an activist for 30 years. I've been involved with Food Not Bombs. I ran a food pantry for 17 years. Um, I, so I've always worked with frontline communities and I am bilingual. You know, I speak Spanish and uh, my children are mixed race. So we've been out there, you know, we've been out there frontline. I was been involved in criminal justice action, you know, um, writing ledges from writing legislation to being on the street over Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, all the way up to recently. So aside from being the peace activist, you know, um, but it's really difficult. And even though I had little money and no staff, I got 3.5% of the vote, left, left, you know, for, for state uh, senator. So this year I want to do well, you know, against this 22 year incumbent warmonger. And, but I have to figure out how I'm going to do that with no staff and no money. So any pointers, you know, I do have um, a lot of fans across the state be being part of the peace movement. So I need to learn to capitalize on the resources that are available to me and not worry about spending a lot of cash. Yeah. Thank you. And ask for help. Ask, ask, ask. So Sherry Wells just put in the chat that she's had people contribute just by being a driver, right? And so I think, you know, right, Ubers are expensive, man, you know, especially these days. And granted, just, you know, driving around is expensive um, with gas the way it is. But, um, you know, you just, you have to ask for help. And I, you know, I mean, I don't know what part of Connecticut and which part, you know, which local county Green Party chapter, if there even is one, but hopefully the folks who asked you to run, um, you, you know, can step up to the plate more and help you because you can't run a successful campaign on only a thousand dollars. And you shouldn't have to, right? You should be able to get more support from your local party and from the community. Um, but the, thank you. I mean, just thank you for your, your service, um, both in the 
emergency food world, but also as a Green Party candidate and um, and for sharing your story. It was great. Sherry, I see your hand up. Yeah, and I just want to encourage folks that um, uh, to also not get caught up in this thing that just because you've ran other campaigns that you can't raise money this time. Um, because there is an art, to, there is a, a total art to raising money. Um, for me, it took me some time to learn that. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'm always open to having uh, legitimate conversations with other folks. I think we also continue to ask the same people that don't have money for money. Uh, and I think that you have a better opportunity of raising money with the more people that you know. So um, folks that are thinking about running for office, you really have to grow your social capital. You have to get out there. You have to get active in different, act, you know, different stuff that's happening in the world and really grow your pool of people. Uh, David Cobb used to use this term all the time, big hat, no cattle. Um, and we really have to expand who we know, who we're talking to, um, who we're organizing, who we're bringing into our fold, instead of just having meetings that have the same five people. So that's one. And then I think the, the second thing is, um, is that um, I think as Greens, we're going to be taken more seriously. Um, the more people we have and the more we're serious about going after um, the money that is out there uh, and asking people to back up, uh, you know, issues that they actually really care about. Uh, and really becoming passionate about those issues and how Greens are different. Uh, when running for political office. So yeah, just, you know, expand your pool. Constantly think about growing, building, um, because I see a lot of other candidates that, you know, they also get caught up in this thing saying, you know, nobody's helping me. I can't raise any money. Um, all of these kinds of things. So, I mean, I get up every day of my life and I say, who are going to be the next five or 10 new people I meet the next day? Who are going to be the next five or 10 people I meet? And how can I plug those next five to 10 people into what is happening? Uh, because, you know, a handful of us that are, are part of the choir are not going to be able to change the things that are happening in the world. Yeah. Um, and I saw Leanna's question in the chat. So I'm going to get to that next. But I do want to say like, this is your first fundraising device. You're this phone, right? And whether I, you know, you probably have a hundred people in here easily and you need to call every single person, whether it's your, you know, the person who cuts your hair, your former babysitters, nephews, whatever, you know, like whoever they are, you know them and you need to ask them for money. Um, whether, you know, if you're the kind of person who can ask for a hundred dollars, great. But even if you can only ask for $10, that's still $10 times a hundred people. That's a thousand dollars, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, give people the opportunity to participate in your campaign. That's what it's about. All right. I, there's a lot of hands in the chat and we only have about eight minutes left, but let me just get to the honest question. Cause it was in here for a while and then we'll go through the queue. Um, Liana asked, what specifically convinced Sherry that running as a candidate with the Green Party was worthwhile? As someone on the front line who was already involved in many projects, what did the campaign with the what did the campaign um, offer or provide? Like what did what do we do to convince you? Um I I think uh for me uh it was really convincing me that um, at least the two people that were there, Hillary and, um, oh my God, why can't I think of his name? I think it was the, Mike Nance. Does that sound right? 
No, uh, from the union young man that ran in Roxborough. Oh, Hugh, Hugh Giordano, yeah. Yeah, so Hillary and Hugh really convinced me that um, they would hold my hand through this process. Uh, so that was it, uh, is that not just myself was gonna like throw myself in the deep end of the pool and figure out if I could swim, but they were there saying that they were gonna go through the process with me. And we did for the most part. And they did, and they're still doing it. And 50 campaigns later. later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, I see Kira, your hand up next. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, the biggest issue I find is that the issues that you bring these people in on are not necessarily the issues that we talk about. It's going to be living wage, and housing, and because of the day to day, they might not be so interested in. Climate change, I mean, climate change is a big issue for us, or, you know, environmental stuff, but, you know, your rent is too high, and mm -hmm. don't make enough money. That, I mean, we have to bring them into the Green Party on something, and so we have to, we have to recognize that some of the issues that mm -hmm. we talk about in the Green Party might not be might not be the same climate refugees <laughs> yeah yeah they just they need to be translated i think into for different contexts and Kira, sorry you have a lot of background noise wherever you are if you can mute um but i think yeah that's a good point like people you know especially at this level in the party you know, we tend to have a lot of like, you know, really great policy wonks who are narrowly zeroing in on this like one specific thing that everybody must care about. And while it's probably true and really important, you know, we have to keep in mind the sort of kitchen table bread and butter issues that are keeping most people up at night. Um, and it's not, you know, like climate change is real and it's coming for us all, um, poor and rich, but and the poor will certainly feel the brunt of it worse and first if, and have already. But that doesn't mean that, you know, folks immediate, you know, need to feed their kids and pay the rent. It's certainly gonna, is gonna trump that. And we need to be sensitive to that and figure out how to talk, talk about it. Um, Felina. Oh, I was just uh, piggybacking on uh, uh, what you said about some experiences of being um, the staff of campaigns and, one of the experiences I've had was when I was uh, a treasurer for the governor's campaign here in Ohio. And, um, you, you know, the candidates you, as treasurer, I think uh, one of the things I learned is to be um, more demanding on not having the candidate themselves do anything when it comes to the treasurer. And I, I learned that the hard way because, you know, some people mm -hmm. will just walk up to Connie and just give her money and everything and she'll just go deposit it but she won't break she didn't break down her deposits and it drove me crazy because I couldn't reconcile correctly when it came to my reports because I had to try to guess like okay how okay which check was she'll like just deposit everything and not write down like $20 was this check and $20 was cash and then she just say $40 deposit and so I'm <laughs> sitting here trying to guess on what was what. And then my numbers didn't come out right. And then here's the Secretary of State, like, why are your numbers coming out right? It's like, cause like, cause Connie's just put deposits in the bank and not breaking it down. Right, you like, can't throw your candidate under the bus like that. <laughs> I know, <laughs> and I'm trying to figure it out. And next thing you know, we got to, you know, audit the bank to figure out how the, right. how the deposits were broken down. So yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think it takes those of us who have that, you know, professional background and bureaucratic mindset, you know, and I say this is also someone who's worked in the nonprofit sector for a long time and have managed grants and, you know, like I've been to a bajillion trainings about, you know, even though I'm not an accountant, you know, about, you know, how to manage money and keep things, you know, kosher for all kinds of processes. Like we need to be the ones who step up and help and 
you know, be the wind beneath the wing, so to speak. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and to play those roles and figure out how to translate all that in a way that everybody else can make sense of it and, you know, comply, but still get the trains running on time. Um, and that's really the dam. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to turn this into a commercial for being a good treasurer, but, <laughs> um, but that's like a huge thing. You I are. Mean, just, thank you. Um, but you know, it's not just the treasury, but other, you know, website creation, um, you know, media like work, there's definitely a handful of roles that are, you know, I don't want to say best done by professionals, but like, you know, that have like a certain professional, um, you know, history and set of skills that if you can find someone who can volunteer to do those things, that's great. And those of, I'm just saying like those of us with those skill sets, we need to be stepping up to the plate um, and putting in the work to help other, to put other folks in front of the camera um, and to make that happen. Um, all right, we've got literally one minute left um, before time. And then um, there will be a little over an hour break at 8 p.m. Um, well, there's a VIP fundraising um, session with uh, Katie Halper and then the 9 p.m. is the main session. Um, so hopefully you got your tickets um, because it is all about the money and being able to raise some so we can spend it on important can candidates and campaigns. Um, any other final comments or thoughts from anyone? Uh, this is Sherry. Again, I just want to say, feel free to use me as a resource. Uh, my hidden agenda is that we're very interested in staying connected to folks that are doing frontline work around the country um, because we're interested in making sure that people are turning themselves into organizers. Um, and, you know, we can help with identifying different potential candidates in different parts of the country as well. Um, so, and uh, yeah, check out the Poor People's Army. Feel free to send folks to our boot camps for political education. Well, thank you everyone. I'm gonna be um, a taskmaster on time and end us on time. Thank you all for participating and good luck in your future races, your current races. Just good luck in your Green Party work. Stay strong and keep at it. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Hillary, for taking the lead on this. No worries. Thanks for, for being my, the, a good partner in crime, as they say. Okay. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>